Hello, and you should have your cardiac notes for this video lecture. We will be going over symptoms that might indicate something wrong with the heart and cardiac system. We're going to be looking at tests of cardiac function, so what tests or procedures could we use to tell us how the heart is working? What are ways we could tell that the heart may have been damaged? We'll look at cardiac enzymes that are useful when we're screening or trying to diagnose a myocardial infarction, which is the fancy name for a heart attack. And we'll look at, look at some tests or procedures that might be used to screen for your risk of cardiac disease. So some of the symptoms that go with uh, possible involvement of the heart would include this list, and I imagine that you can read through them, and most of these will make sense. So a heartbeat over 100 in adult is considered tachycardia. Obviously, that's if you're resting, not just that you got done exercising. This one is kind of something that you may not have heard of, but squatting posture in children. So imagine you work as a playground duty or a teacher, and you watch a little child who runs around, and then they squat down. And you ask them why they do that, and they may not even realize that it's something they do, but you watch them and they do it fairly frequently. If you think of a squatting posture, it would essentially decrease blood flow to the lower part of the body because you would be putting a kink kind of at the area to the lower legs. And so the body figures out if there's something wrong with it, that one way it could compensate is pump blood to fewer body parts. So squatting posture in a child could indicate a risk of cardiac disease, that the, the heart can't keep up, and so the body's figured out a way to compensate. Uh, if you go unconscious, it could be things like electrolytes. It could just be that you're dehydrated. But all of that, uh, the dehydration piece would tie into cardiac function. If my heart doesn't have enough fluid to pump around, or there's a condition called supraventricular tachycardia where your heart beats excessively fast. And because it's beating so fast, your ventricles don't have good time to fill. And because they're not filling, they're not pumping out a um, sufficient amount of blood, and so you may lose consciousness. So if you have loss of consciousness or dizziness, we might screen, and, and especially if you said, I have a fluttering in my chest, this palpitation, we might screen you for the risk of supraventricular tachycardia. This one reminds you to listen to your patients. Sometimes a patient can't tell you what's wrong, but they know something is. And so we call that the feeling of impending doom, where a patient may say to you, I just have this feeling something bad is going to happen, or I don't know how to describe it to you. That's what the patient might say, but I just don't feel right. Something's wrong. Uh, hypertension is different for different age groups, but in most people, if you have a diastolic blood pressure, that's a lower number, more than 80, you're pre-hypertensive, and over 90, you're hypertensive. And then we also look at the systolic number, the higher of the two, and if it's over in the 150s, you're considered pre-hypertensive, and over 160 for more stage groups is hypertension. Hypotension is just the opposite. You have a blood pressure that's lower than normal, and that hypotension could go with dehydration. It could go with that supraventricular tachycardia that would cause you to lose consciousness. So hypotension might go with this fluttering in the chest sensation. I'll bet you've seen something like this before. This is a universal sign for someone having a heart attack. Uh, in most cases, and this is not all patients, but generally, especially in males, the way that a myocardial infarction will manifest itself is they'll feel a pressure in their chest, kind of in the sternum area. So if you look where that person's hand is placed, it's right over the esophagus area. So we said reflux could cause symptoms that might be confused with a myocardial infarction. In reverse, somebody might think they have reflux when they're really having a heart attack. So we have this hand over the ch chest, kind of that sternum and cardiac area. Uh, they may have pain that radiates especially to the left jaw, neck area, or the left upper shoulder, the left arm. These are real typical in men. In women, we're learning, they may have a different kind of 
symptomatic process when they're having a myocardial infarction and it would consist more of back pain. So definitely if a woman was having chest pain and right or excuse me left jaw and arm pain we would think myocardial infarction. But we made the mistake of thinking if women didn't come in with those symptoms, they couldn't be having a heart attack. And we found based on new evidence that women may present with back pain as an indicator of cardiac risk. So these people usually do feel sick to their stomach. They may be diaphoretic. They're sweating. They may be more pale. They're more likely to be pale rather than red. What are some tests we might do, and especially if someone presents with a myocardial infarction, what would be the first screening procedure we would do? And that would be an ECG or an EKG. This is kind of the older name, but you can see based on the word electrocardiogram that the best designation is an ECG. And there are numerous types of ways to look at the electrical pattern of the heart. We can do a 12 lead ECG, and I'll show you what that would look like, or some of you may have had that done. There's a cardiac monitor, and I'm sorry I have a cold going, um, so I'm going to be snuffling here. There's a cardiac monitor that we hook the patient up to when they present to the emergency room or to the intensive care unit. And this reminds us that the first test we do if we think someone's having a myocardial infarction is um, some sort of ECG procedure. We'll then talk about some uh, devices which m measure the electrical activity of the heart, but they do it on a longer term basis, this Holter monitor or device called an event monitor. So let's look at what these things might look like. This is one example of a heart rate monitor or a cardiac monitor. And just like the name implies, it can monitor rates, but it can also monitor rhythms. It would have some sort of way, either at a computer desk or here on the monitor itself, that you could tell it to print out a strip of paper that would include marks that represent specific time periods so that you could measure how far apart certain electrical patterns are. If you've had anatomy and physiology, the heart um, has some waves that we describe as P waves or QRS complexes. And so we can look at how far apart those are because there's a normal length of time that a cardiac signal should take to get through certain um, anatomical locations of the heart. So a heart rate monitor would be, uh, there would be leads placed on your chest. In today's cardiac units or emergency rooms are going to be little sticky tabs. And connected to those little sticky tabs are some wires that feed into this device. And they're monitoring the electrical pattern of your heart. This one is a 12 lead ECG, and this is an older one where they use suction cups to stay on the patient. Now it would be those sticky tabs, but you can see some wires come off. The difference between a 12 lead ECG and a cardiac monitor or a heart rate monitor is this one's going to stay on you all the time. So I think of this one as a movie. It's looking at you all the time that this is hooked on to you. However, this one gets us detail. So patients are always confused. They're on a heart rate monitor and then the physician says I've ordered a heart rate test or an EKG and they say wait a minute doesn't that thing up there show my EKG and the physician said yes but you're getting another EKG. And so patients think we might be doing that just for the money when in fact what it is is this one gives us more detail. So it's likely, especially if we think a patient's having a myocardial infarction, that they're on a heart rate monitor or a cardiac monitor. We're then going to have a 12 lead ECG and look at the detail that we can get. And what you see here is these Roman numerals. So lead 1, lead 2, lead 3, and these would go through 12 leads. So this is usually one sheet of paper that has a whole bunch of leads represented and you can see these little grid marks. Those are the ones that I told you they're specific distances apart in millimeters so that we can figure out the time between QRS signals, P waves, so we can look for those things. By looking at 12 leads what they're essentially looking at is different electrical patterns through the heart. So this gets us more detail, but if I think of the cardiac monitor as a movie, I would think of the 12 lead ECG as a snapshot. If you've had one done, it really almost takes longer to put those little sticky tabs on you and get the test, or excuse me, to get you prepared for the test than it does to do the test itself. So the 12 lead ECG typically 
it would take maybe five minutes to put those little tabs on you and one or two minutes to run the test. The only requirement needing that the patient needs to be able to hold still. Now we move to some devices that look at the electrical pattern of the heart. So they're also looking at an ECG pattern, but they're doing it over a longer period of time. If you've ever had a problem with your car, let's say it makes a specific noise, and so you finally get an appointment at the mechanic, you take it in, and sure enough, your car doesn't make that noise right then. Well, what if I'm a patient who I say, every once in a while I feel my heart and it feels like there's a whole bunch of butterflies in my chest and I check my heartbeat and it seems to be going really fast. I get an appointment to see my doctor and he says, well, I don't really see any of that happening now. So what if it's something that only happens at certain times of day when maybe a doctor's office isn't open or maybe it only happens once or twice a week and you really don't know when it's going to happen? you could have a Holter monitor. So a Holter monitor would be like an ambulatory, one that you can walk in, ECG. And these have gotten smaller and smaller to where you could wear them in a little pouch or their kind of credit card size. With the purpose of a Holter monitor would be that you would wear this electrical um, collecting device, this um, ECG. You would wear it for maybe 24 to 48 hours. And that's a Holter monitor. And here's what it might look like on a patient. You can see it's fairly mobile. If he wants to take a shower, he just unsnaps those little buttons from the sticky pads. And when he's done, he would color code those. They're color coded. He could just match those back up. So he would have these leads, and he's going to wear that for about 24 to 48 hours. Well, what if it takes months to kind of catch that pattern? As you can imagine, because we have microchip technology, we can make these things fairly small. So here's one about the size of a credit card or an iPod. Um, and I don't know if they have an app. I don't think they're there yet that you can just buy an app that feeds right into your iPod or your iPhone or something yet. But I bet we're close. This one just has two little leads that would stick on little sticky pads on your chest. You would wear this in a shirt pocket or in a little necklace type of thing around your neck. It does have the ability for the patient to be able to push a button and tell the device to record. The Holter monitor and the cardiac event monitor and the heart rate monitor, the cardiac monitor, all have the ability that if they recognize an abnormal rate, so maybe something over 100 or less than 60 beats a minute, or if it's an abnormal electrical pattern, they have the ability to automatically spit out a piece of paper that would have the information on it, or in the case of these devices, they would automatically record to that hard drive, essentially. Um, when that happens, then the doctor can say, okay, why don't you send me that data, and it can be done over phone lines. So you could either take this into the doctor's office to be read, like a SIM card type of thing, or the doctor's office could say um, you dial in this number and hook your device up to it, to your phone. So a cardiac event monitor can record automatically under certain circumstances, or the patient can say, when I have that fluttering sensation, I was told to push the record button to make sure that it's capturing what's happening to the electrical pattern of my heart when I have those symptoms. The advantage of the cardiac event monitor is it's made to be worn up to 30 days. Okay, stress testing. What if it's something that happens with your heart only under exercise? Um, what if I'm a patient who's been really sedentary and now I've decided I want to be more active? So I've watched commercials on TV and they say if I'm going to take up some sort of significant exercise or weight loss program, I should notify my physician, and so I've done that, and my physician might say, I'd like you to go for a stress test. So a stress test is putting someone on a treadmill that can go through a specific pattern of intensity, and we can look at what happens to the electrical pattern, or the EKG is recorded as they go through that pattern that increases intensity. And we could look at, are there changes that occur only with exercise? As you can imagine, we have some patients, maybe because of age or physical condition, who cannot exercise. So they couldn't get on a bike and do this, or they couldn't get on a treadmill and do this. And we have a chemical way to make the heart think it's exercising. 
So we could do a chemical stress test where we inject some medication that makes the heart think it's exercising. All right, what if we did an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, and when we're doing an ultrasound of the heart, we call it an echocardiogram, not to be confused with um, electrocardiogram, which was the electrical pattern of the heart. An echocardiogram, because it uses ultrasound, can tell us about the shape and function of the heart. So they're going to get kind of these fuzzy images, but I'll bet as you look at this, you can see right ventricle, right atria, left atria, left ventricle. You can see the septum here. And so normally when the left ventricle and right ventricle contract, they do so pretty much at the same time. And this septum should stay fairly rigid in the middle. Um, if you had a lot of pressure in the left ventricle, you might have this start to impinge more on that right ventricle. Let me get that right now. Sorry about that phone call. Um, the next thing let me show you is you could see the thickness of the heart wall. So we remember the left side is the pump side of the heart. Can you see this thicker wall here than you see on the right ventricle? And if this were the moving, and they are when they're in echo, you could see the cardiac valve. So you can see the um, tricuspid valve here on the right and the mitral valve here on the left. When they do an electrical, or excuse me, an echocardiogram, told you not to make that mistake, they can also record waveform tracings. So they can generate um, or record the flows that are generated by the heart. So this might be we have the probe over the pulmonary artery and we can estimate pulmonary artery pressures and look for pulmonary hypertension, a blood pressure that's too high in the pulmonary system. We could measure blood pressure or waveforms in the aorta and we could estimate the blood pressure in the systemic system, in the pump side of the heart, the left side of the heart. So during an echocardiogram, we can look at the size of the heart, the shape of the heart. We can look at the heart working. So this is a test that would look at function and structure of the heart. We can look at electrical, excuse me, not electrical patterns, flow patterns of the heart, and we can estimate pressures based on those. So we could estimate right-sided heart pressures, the pulmonary system, and left-sided heart pressures, the systemic circulatory system. We can do a stress echo. And again, we could put the patient on a bike, or we could put them on a treadmill, and you can imagine it's a little bit harder to have this wand when they're doing um, one of those procedures, so it's more likely that if we did a chemical echo, where we give the medication that makes the heart go faster and think it's exercising, we would probably do that when we do an echocardiogram, a stress echo. Um, let's see. There are a multitude of medical imaging techniques that we could do to look at the heart. We can do a CAT scan. So a CT scan can be used to look at the size and shape of the heart. It really um, uh, doesn't as just a regular CT scan, we don't see the blood vessels of the heart, but we can add in things like electron beam CT. Um, we can do a CTA, which would be a CT, computed tomography angiography, and angiography means we're studying the blood vessels. So here's MRA, magnetic resonance imaging. We're using that large magnet, and we're doing angiography, which means we're studying the blood vessels. We can do some nuclear medicine imaging, and then we'll talk about just generic angiography. And so let me show you what some of those might look like. There's an area of medicine called nuclear medicine. And what they do is use radioisotopes to get images of uh, heart structures. We could do images of the brain based on this. They could do images. Um, we kind of talked about this when we talked about the nuclear imaging that would be done of the thyroid when we did the radioactive iodine uptake test. That would have been done in a nuclear medicine lab. So imagine that we take some radioactive nucleotides and those could be tagged to blood cells. They could be tagged to iodine like in the thyroid test. They could be tagged to uh, glucose 
That's something they might do for a PET scan or a SPECT scan. And if you've heard of a PET scan, most commonly they would be used to screen or, or um, indicate the effectiveness of cancer treatment. We give you something to see if the cancer cells are consuming that glucose and if there's um, an abnormal location of that in the body. So let me show you what some of these might look like. Here's a nuclear imaging study of the heart. And as you can imagine, the red area would indicate an area of large amount of activity. So depending on what we've tied those little radionucleotides to, have we tied it to glucose, have we tied it to blood, we can look at um, hot, so we can look for abnormal areas of activity in the heart, or is it in the brain, etc. You can see this one, the focus is looking at the blood vessels of the heart. So they're looking at those coronary arteries and they're seeing if they're open. So nuclear imaging could be used to study the blood vessels of the heart or the muscle of the heart. Here's a Sestamibi, and this is on page two of your notes. It talks about um, a nuclear medicine test that would be done. And this would be generally for patients who seem to be having cardiac type symptoms. They complain of chest pain, um, but when we do their ECG, it looks a little bit unusual, but it doesn't really look like they're having a myocardial infarction. Or maybe they seem to be a younger patient who has this chest pain on a fairly frequent basis. They might be sent for this nuclear medicine procedure to screen in more detail for a possible myocardial infarction or um, maybe something that that stress test didn't show. So a nuclear medicine scan. Again, we could put them on a treadmill. Um, we could give them the chemical, the medication that makes the heart think it's exercising. But I usually see sesame be used when we've kind of gone through that normal pattern of screening for myocardial infarction or maybe a stress test. We've already done those. And we see some things that are kind of suspicious, but we haven't truly made a diagnosis yet. Here's a cardiac CT. We would be studying the blood vessels, the bigger blood vessels of the heart. And we can see these are numbered atria and ventricles. We really wouldn't see fine details of blood vessels if we just do a cardiac CT, but we could see size and shape of the heart. And if they do this with a specific type of CT, we could kind of reproduce it in 3D imaging. Here's an electronic beam CT, and that would be more focused on, in this case, they looked for plaque which is cholesterol deposits in the blood vessels. And can you see those in the blood vessels of the heart? And the aorta, this tube that runs right along your backbone, they see some cholesterol deposits there. Look at CTA. So anytime we put this A with it, we're doing angiography, and that's a term that means we're studying the blood vessels. If I put veinography in front of it, you'd know we're studying the veins. And what if I put arteriography in front of it? I'll bet you know what we're studying there. But look at the detail we can see of the blood vessel that feeds the heart. And that's usually what's interrupted either with plaque or a blood clot when someone has a myocardial infarction. Um, you may have heard of people who have stents, and so maybe they did a procedure like a CTA, and they found that they had a narrowed area in a blood vessel, and so they put in a device that kind of holds that blood vessel open. Isn't this cool? So the advantage of MRI typically is it gives us better detail of soft tissue. And definitely the heart is a soft tissue. I talked before about how those ventricles contract at the same time, and you could look at the septum between those. So here's uh, atria, ventricles. I want you to look at the thickness of this ventricle and the thickness of this ventricle wall, and I bet you could tell me which one is the left ventricle. So the left ventricle is the pump side. And so I look at the thickness of this wall compared to the thinness of this wall. This is the right ventricle, left ventricle. You can see blood moving. There's blood moving in the aorta. I could see if we had better clarity here, we could see the, the mitral and tricuspid valves working, tricuspid and mitral valves working. We can see the shape of the heart, the size of the heart, and we can actually see it function. 
So this would be a test of function. What if we do cardiac MRI, but we take the picture a different way? What if we're looking at you from the side? So we're coming in from armpit to armpit, and we're slicing you. So look at this. What structure comes off your heart, has an arch, has these three blood vessels? Remember your brachiocephalic and carotid arteries that come off. And then we come down to your lower aorta, your descending aorta, and then we have your mesenteric and renal arteries that would come off. Look at these thoracic arteries out here. So look at that detail we can see when we do an MRI. An MRA, now we're using that magnet to do angiography. And so we're studying the blood vessels of the heart, and they're telling you left anterior descending, and they name those hearts, or those blood vessels, excuse me, can you see that there's some narrowed areas? So they found some narrowed areas, and they might go in with a stent then to splint those open. This procedure is called angiography. And with angiography, and I realize I'm kind of jumping around in your notes right now, if you go to your mm, fourth page, you'll see a thing that says catheterization and angiography. When we do angiography, we put a catheter actually into the blood vessels of your heart. And this is the person's sternum area, and they've had a heart attack before, and I know that because when they're done, your sternum doesn't heal, and so we leave sternal wires. We leave some wires that kind of hold your sternum together still. So the heart would be behind that sternum. And with angiography, we're putting a catheter up your groin area into your left artery. And we're going back to study those blood vessels of the heart, the ones that feed the heart, with the ones that would be blocked if you have a myocardial infarction. And so they would inject dye. As you can imagine, this could be a life-threatening procedure because of bleeding through that groin area or the bigger risk because we're in an artery and we inject dye. There's going to be a short period of time where your heart doesn't really receive oxygen. And so um, there's always a person monitoring what's happening to your EKG as they do an angiography procedure. And they would have some sort of code system to tell the physician, hey, take a look at that monitor or maybe remove that catheter for just a minute. So they might say something like, one, two, three, one, two, three, because the patient is awake during this procedure generally, and so they wouldn't want to say, hey, look at the screen now, or, oh, that's really bad. So what do we do to, to diagnose a myocardial infarction? Well, we've said the first thing we look at is what kind of symptoms is the patient having? We look at their clinical history. Have they had a heart attack before? I'll bet if you've been to the doctor, you've filled out some sort of form that says, um, how many of your siblings are living? What age are they? What diseases do they have? Is your mother and father still alive? And what's their um, medical condition like? Do they have a history of diabetes or heart disease? So we'd look at your family history and then your clinical history. Are you a smoker, um, which increases your risk of plaque? in your blood vessels and increases your risk of heart disease? Do you have a very stressful job which might do that? Have you had a previous history of heart, heart disease? Um, we would then do an EKG. So the minute they hit the ER, we're putting a cardiac monitor on them and calling for that 12 lead ECG. Then we would take some blood and do some procedures called cardiac enzymes. And we're looking to see has this patient got either this plaque kind of blocking a blood vessel off, or do they have a blood clot that's formed because of that narrowed area? This shows kind of how we might triage these patients. So a patient presents to the emergency room with chest pain. And pretty much in every emergency room in the nation, that's the one symptom that will automatically get you taken back and put you in a bed, is if you come in with chest pain. They would then say, let's put the ECG monitor on you, and you say, yes, it shows that you're having an acute myocardial infarction, and we need to do all we can to restore that blood flow. So we're going to give you medication that would dissolve a blood clot. We talked about medication that would keep clots from forming, and those were called Coumadin and Warfarin. Now we're talking about medications that will break down clots, and that would be TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, 
or medications like streptokinase or urokinase. Those would be ones that would break down a clot. So now we're on page two of your notes. We're looking at what are some of those tests we could do which are called cardiac enzymes. So we go here. You have a high probability of acute myocardial infarction. It's telling us there's a Q wave change on your EKG or ST depression or T wave inversion. So there's some common things that happen when you have coronary artery disease, CAD, or an acute myocardial infarction. And so they give this person a medication that keeps clots from forming aspirin or heparin, and they give nitroglycerin, which dilates blood vessels. So I bet you've seen movies or something, or you may know someone who has nitroglycerin pills that they put under their tongue. It's a real strong blood vessel dilator. So if I had just a little narrow area, maybe that would help me enough to keep a clot from forming. I bet you've seen the commercials on TV of a baby aspirin saved my life. All right, what if we go to the patient that we're not quite sure if they're having a myocardial infarction. They're having some typical symptoms, and so we might draw that sample of blood and do cardiac markers, or we might do nuclear imaging such as that Sestamibi stay or Sestamibi test, and then we might have them stay in our cardiac care unit for just a uh, little less than a day. There are patients who we look at their EKG pattern and it doesn't look like they have anything wrong with them and so we say you know what maybe you are having uh, reflux and so we treat them for that and send them out of there I don't want you to memorize this chart but this is really what we're doing in the hospital is kind of this differential diagnosis of is it clearly an acute myocardial infarction or are we having to move to other procedures to help us determine that or are you not having a myocardial infarction and we diagnose what you are having? Maybe it's an anxiety attack. So differential diagnosis with chest pain was you're having reflux symptoms or maybe a panic or anxiety attack can mimic a myocardial infarction. Okay, cardiac enzymes. We could do a test called AST and you've heard that before. We talked about ALT and AST and we said ALT was specific for the liver. It was an enzyme that's released when the liver's damaged. We said AST was not specific for the liver. It was released when heart, kidney, liver were damaged. So AST levels would elevate with, with um, damage to cardiac tissue. LDH this is a marker that's found in blood. It's an enzyme that when cardiac tissue is damaged, the levels will elevate. There are some isoenzymes that are more specific to the heart. So specifically LDH1 and LDH2, if those are elevated, we're pretty sure that you have some sort of damage to heart tissue. Similarly, CK, creatinine kinase, is an enzyme that's found in cardiac tissue. It's also found in skeletal tissue. So if you were a car accident patient and you have a lot of bruising and we're trying to figure out did you have the car accident because you had a myocardial infarction and then crashed, it might be hard to sort out if we're just looking at CK levels because they're not just specific for cardiac tissue. But the isoenzyme CKMB, and that stands for muscle brain, which seems weird because it doesn't mention cardiac, but creatinine kinase MB is more specific marker for um, cardiac damage. Myoglobin, I bet you remember if you've had ANP and you studied the heart, that myoglobin was found inside the cardiac muscle and if the heart is damaged it releases that enzyme into the bloodstream. Now we go to troponin and troponin is an enzyme found specifically in cardiac tissue and troponin I and troponin T are especially sensitive markers for myocardial infarction. So in your notes on page 2 it says cardiac markers and these are called heart enzymes. The one that is considered the gold standard currently is troponin. So not every patient may get this. If I go back to this list, this patient based on just their EKG alone or their ECG alone they've diagnosed that they had a myocardial infarction. But look at these people. These two groups of patients would get cardiac enzyme tests to see if they're having myocardial infarction. And the one that would be done is troponin I or troponin T. Usually I see troponin T 
and that is specific for cardiac. Now they might combine it, troponin and myoglobin and CK and LDH and AST. So you say, if this one's the gold standard, why do all these procedures? Well, this chart kind of shows you. The ideal cardiac marker is going to elevate quickly. The enzyme is going to elevate quickly when it's released into the bloodstream after damage to heart tissue. It's going to stay elevated long enough that we could catch those ones where the patient maybe didn't come in promptly. Uh, it's hunting season. So can you imagine that there are a few people out there who are not in the best shape, but they are going to go hunting. And so I get a group of my buddies together and I go up hunting and I've been walking around on the mountain and I start to have some kind of chest pain. Do you think I would go to the other guys in the hunting group and say, guys, I'm sorry, but you need to take me into the hospital? Or would you in your own mind say, gosh, I bet I'm just having indigestion because of the chili I had last night? Or I'll just kind of wait it out and see if it gets better. So a lot of macho people especially are going to say, I'll just wait it out and see if it gets better. So they might come to us 48 hours after it's happened. Well, look at the problem with myoglobin then. Myoglobin was a good marker because it elevated quickly, but look how quickly it returned to normal. And so we wouldn't, we may be miss an event if that's all we look at. Look at troponin. It doesn't elevate as quickly as myoglobin. And so a reason to combine myoglobin and troponin together when we screen for risk of myocardial infarction or the occurrence of cardiac tissue damage. So it's not unusual to see us, even though troponin is the gold standard, to get maybe when we do the enzyme test to do all of those, maybe an LDH, a CKMB, a myoglobin, and a troponin. And we look at those because they each will kind of do different things. Uh, these big spikes, can you imagine if you have a blockage in your blood vessel? It's not going to let that enzyme be released into the blood very much until we reperfuse you. So if we have this patient, who's come in and they're having a myocardial infarction, if we did markers on them, once they get them reperfused, we might see a big spike whoops, in these numbers while that body flushes that into the bloodstream. And then because no further cardiac tissue is being damaged, they would come back down. Now, cardiac enzymes, just like liver enzymes, uh, like the LDH, or excuse me, um, ALT, the usually the higher the level in the blood the more tissue that's been damaged so if we have a really high troponin level there's been quite a bit of cardiac tissue damage and that's usually not a good thing but I want you to kind of understand how these numbers might spike initially as we reperfuse the heart and those enzymes flush into the bloodstream and then as there's no more damage occurring we see those numbers start to come down okay BNP and in your notes, this is on page three, it talks about B-type naturitic peptides. Are you ready to say that? B-type naturitic peptide. And in the hospital, we shorten it to BNP. So I want you to look at your notes, and you can see that BNP is going to be useful to help us know when the heart is under stress. So when the ventricles are being kind of overstretched, they release this marker so it could be used to kind of tell us the person whose heart is under stress maybe because of a myocardial infarction. We use it in patients who have COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Patients who have that chronic disease present to our hospital and they have one of two things typically wrong with them. They have an exacerbation, a chronic condition that's made worse due to either pneumonia or cardiac damage um, in the form of congestive heart failure where their heart is kind of trying to pump too much fluid around. If their BNP levels are elevated, that tells us a patient who probably needs admitted to the hospital because it's their heart. If their BNP levels are normal in the COPD patient, it tells us the problem with them is their lungs and if their oxygen tests look fairly decent, we could give them antibiotics to treat their pneumonia and send them home. 
So BNP could be used to screen, is it pulmonary disease or cardiac disease that's causing an exacerbation in patients like COPD patients, or it could also be in a patient who's having a myocardial infarction. It tells us BNP levels elevate when the ventricles are being overstretched or they're under stress. Okay, lipids. Now we're moving on to looking at tests of cardiac disease, your risk of having a heart attack. So if you're having a heart attack, we're not going to hurry and draw your cholesterol and triglyceride levels. It's more common that I see my lipids when I go in for a complete physical. It's more common that a doctor would draw my lipid levels if I'm overweight, but there are skinny people who have heart attacks. So it's not just to those people who are overweight. If you have a family history of heart disease, the doctor should be monitoring your blood lipids. Um, if I've had a heart attack, they're going to do blood lipids and monitor those to see, am I at risk for a subsequent one? What could I do? And I'll bet you've seen commercials on TV for medications like Lipitor or um, all sorts. There's a huge variety of statin or similar type drugs that are all aimed at lowering blood cholesterol levels. So when we do a lipid profile, these are usually the things we look at. We do triglyceride levels, a cholesterol level, and then we do a lipoprotein panel. So it breaks this total cholesterol into the types of cholesterol, which are chylomicrons, low-density lipoproteins, very low-density lipoproteins, and high-density lipoproteins. And if, I guess, um, it just talks that if you're Low-density lipoproteins and very low-density lipoproteins are elevated. You have a higher risk of heart disease. We're not sure of the link necessarily between triglycerides, but there's definitely a tendency to think that the higher your triglyceride levels are, the more likely you are to have cardiac risk, so a risk of myocardial infarction. Um, the high-density lipoprotein is the one we'd like to be elevated. It's kind of a protective, it's a blood vessel protector. It cleans out the bad cholesterol from the blood vessels. And you can increase your high density lipoproteins with things like um, fish oil. So if you know someone who takes a fish oil supplement, um, cooking with good oils like olive oil, um, peanut oils, those things are um, found to be protective. They're a protective type of lipid. So we'd like to lower these and increase this one. Um, the way we lower these ones is we might use red rice yeast extract. So that would be a natural way to do it. Um, niacin. Uh, so vitamin B, I think 12 or 6 is niacin. And um, then we have prescription medications which lower those blood lipid levels. Other um, indicators of cardiac risk is a homocysteine test, and this is on page um, four of your notes, right above that catheterization and angiography. Look up and for the next bolded thing. It talks about homocysteine. Uh, this is one that they're not quite sure of the relationship with which if we alter your homocysteine levels, can we decrease your risk of heart disease? But they do know that patients who have myocardial infarction have higher than normal homocysteine levels. Um, there are some scientists fa that found that it's easy to lower your homocysteine levels. You can do it with folic acid and vitamin B and vitamin B12. So you could take something like niacin and re reduce your homocysteine levels. Um, and so they said maybe if we do that, we'll see patients who have less risk of heart disease. And there's still some studies looking at that relationship, but we're not quite sure. It isn't definitely as promising as we thought it once was. We thought if we could lower patients' homocysteine levels, then we could decrease their risk of cardiac disease. And that wasn't as, um, the outcome of that study was not as good as they thought it would be. Um, but right now, homocysteine could be another test that's put in with your cardiac lipids because we know that just like if patients have those low-density lipoproteins or very low-density lipoproteins that are elevated, they have a higher risk of myocardial infarction. So do patients who have elevated homocysteine levels have an elevated risk of cardiac 
disease. C-reactive protein. And your C-reactive protein starts at the bottom of page 3 and goes to the top of page 4. And CRP is used to screen for inflammatory disease or infection. So I see this done in intensive care units when we're screening for infection. When there's inflammation or infection, infection CRP levels go up. Well, there are a lot of people who believe that cardiac disease starts as kind of an inflammatory disease in the blood vessels. So increased CRP levels could be due to inflammation or infection. And we have it here in the cardiac lecture because of the inflammation piece. If you look at your levels on page 4, it says if you have CRP levels, a normal is less than 1. And so if you have a level less than 1, you're at low risk of cardiovascular disease. And if we are screening for infection, you have a low risk of infection. You're at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease if your CRP levels are higher than 3. Now, when we're screening for infection, we have patients with CRP levels that might be, even though the normal is less than 1, they might have a 92 or 130, which tells us they have a lot of either inflammation or infection. Okay, cardiac catheterization, we mentioned this and we're kind of to that same um, section again on page 4. This is a catheterization lab. The people are wearing surgical sterile clothing. Uh, they would prep this groin area of the person, and if we're studying the uh, right side of the heart, we go up a vein. If we're studying the left side of the heart, we go up the femoral artery. And so they've put a catheter in, and then they can watch on these fluoroscopy monitors, that moving x-ray. They can watch what's happening as they move those catheters around and inject that dye. This is what those instruments might look like. They have different shaped catheters on the end to get into different cardiac blood vessels. And this is what some of those pictures look like. So angiography, we're studying the blood vessels of the heart. In this case, we're studying the coronary arteries. So formally, the name would be arteriography. And we're looking for blockages or twists or narrowed areas where maybe they could be stented open or if you've heard of someone who's had a coronary artery bypass graft if you think of those letters put together it spells cabbage c-a-b-g if I saw in a patient's chart they had a cabbage times three they had a cardiac procedure open heart procedure where the doctor took blood vessel from another part in their body either from their radial artery that's a new way to do it or from their um, hip area, they took an artery and they grafted it onto their coronary arteries. They made a bypass line. If you hear of people who have had a stent, they usually did that during cardiac catheterization. Those catheters could be used to slip a stent over a device that once it's in place, it kind of pops open and holds that blood vessel open. So analysis of blood vessels, we do venography, arteriography, angiography is the generic term saying we're studying the blood vessels. We can study the blood vessels with a procedure called impedance plethysmography. Isn't that a fun word to say? Plethysmography. We could interrupt blood flow and then restore it and watch at the electrical pattern that's generated. We could do Doppler or ultrasound studies of blood vessels like your carotid arteries or the blood vessels in your leg to look for a leg clot. Here's what impedance plethysmography might look like. So they've got a cuff up here that they could blow up and block off blood flow and then restore it. And they have a device all the way around this person's leg that's looking at electrical pattern for when they restore that blood flow. So we impede the blood flow. We release it. And in this case, they're looking at impedance plethysmography, they're looking at that change in pattern. Here's Doppler ultrasound, it shows you different areas. You'd expect a higher pressure in this area up here than when we get down here, and they could look for clots. Most of our Dopplers are color now, and it isn't always that blue means venous blood and red means arterial, but on this scale it does. They can tell, is the blood vessel open? And is there a narrowing or a blockage? Have you got a blood clot maybe in a vein? 
So here's this case study then. I'll give you a minute to read it and I want you to pick out the symptoms that we talked about that might indicate cardiac risk and also look for things that this patient is at risk for because of their clinical history. So he's had that chest pain, the anterior or the front part of the chest. You can imagine he's probably got his hand up there on his chest. He started to feel lightheaded and kind of felt sick to his stomach, had sweating or diaphoresis, had apprehensive that feeling, that feeling of impending doom. Now you and I, I bet most of us don't have nitroglycerin tablets. So what does that tell you about him? He must have a previous history of angina or angina that is pain in the chest caused by blood vessel spasm so he has this medication that he takes when he has those spasms that are supposed to open up those blood vessels and it did not provide him relief so he would have been instructed if you take those pills and they don't help you immediately call 911 what's the first thing we're gonna do and here's some risk factors then so he's overweight and usually obesity is associated, not always, but most commonly with high cholesterol levels. He had that chest pain. He has cold extremities. Where's the body sending the blood flow to? So he's kind of cold and clammy because the heart's going to keep that blood mainly to the central part of it. His heart is going quickly and he has a ventricular callop rhythm. If you've ever heard horses running, that galloping noise, when you listen to the heart of these patients, if they're having a myocardial infarction or the heart's under a lot of pressure, you have a gallop rhythm and it sounds just like that. It means left ventricle is under a lot of stress. His blood pressure is a little bit elevated. So what test? You remember the first test we do if we think they're having a myocardial infarction? And then do we want to measure cholesterol? Is it going to help us diagnose a my myocardial infarction? So. Hopefully your answer to this one should be, what test would you order first? We're going to put an EKG monitor on him or an ECG monitor on him. We're going to say to this one, the answer is no. We don't want to be doing cholesterol tests now. They're not going to help us diagnose a myocardial infarction. You can have high cholesterol levels and not have a, card, a heart attack. You could have low cholesterol levels and have a heart attack. They tell us your risk of heart disease. And the pattern would be the higher the cholesterol levels, the greater your risk, but it's not going to help us diagnose a myocardial infarction. So they did show that his CK levels were elevated. The ECG showed ST segment elevation and Q wave um, development, and those are suspicious from acute myocardial infarction. So we think he's had a heart attack. What's the treatment? We need to reperfuse him. So we need to either take him to cardiac catheterization lab and put a stent in. If it's something that um, the TPA medication, we can just give it to a vein and it finds the place that needs to go. Remember, TPA or tissue plasminogen activator is going to break down clots. They might start him on aspirin. There's a saying, Mona greets all patients. Mona helps us remember if you're coming with chest pain, what are the medications you should get? M is for morphine. We need to relax you so that that left ventricle is not continuing to work and put stress on itself and maybe worsening that damage to that left ventricle, that pump side. O is oxygen, so we're doing Mona greets all patients. Morphine, oxygen, N is nitroglycerin, and A is aspirin. Let's keep clots from forming. Let's give you the nitroglycerin and open up those blood vessels. So Mona greets all patients that come into ER with chest pain. As soon as you get in that bed, we're putting an EKG on you. We're giving you some aspirin. We're giving you some medication that relaxes you and, and kind of helps relax the muscles in your blood vessels a little bit too. And then we're doing these procedures to see if you're having a heart attack. I think I got them all. Oh. What's the treatment? Reperfusion then, stents, medication, um, maybe open heart surgery to do a cabbage, a coronary artery bypass graft. What procedures will help us monitor the patient's response to treatment? We might see those cardiac enzymes spike like troponin and then come back to normal to indicate that you reperfused. Then if they survive all this, that's when we might do cholesterol and triglyceride levels. 
So I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about the procedures and tests that we use to look at the cardiac system. And we will see.